Welcome back to the Festival of Place, the Pineapples, in association with the Design Council. This is a unique event where we bring together developers, designers, and placemakers from across the pineapple from across the built environment to share their work as they compete for a coveted golden pineapple for place. You can hear the bell tolling uh, behind me, which says we're right on time, even though we've started a couple minutes late. Uh, but this is the second session of Creative Reuse, um, a category of projects vying for uh, that pineapple for breathing new life into existing buildings or infrastructure. We have three more projects to go through. Each team has just 10 minutes to present, um, and our judges will then and have 10 minutes to ask questions. You'll be meeting the judges in a moment as they put their questions uh, to our panel. Um, but first I'm going to introduce them. Uh, we have with us Elizabeth Peckett, Head of Asset Management at Allied London, who takes responsibility for asset strategy across the company's portfolio, including Spinning Fields and Leeds Dock. We have Justin Nichols, founding partner of Fathom Architects, who uh, previously worked at both Foster and Make before setting up Fathom and has been involved in projects from Beijing International Airport to Grosvenor Waterside. And we have Blossom Young, head of operations at Poplar Harka, where she leads the social, economic and cultural regeneration strategies and projects um, across projects in East London. So thanks so much to our dedicated judges. Um, they visited these projects. They're here to share their expertise and really deepen and enrich our understanding of, of these uh, projects today. So uh, you can show your appreciation for them and all our speakers by using the emoji button, which is underneath me with a happy face. You can send us applause and thumbs up and whatever this means. Yay. Um, and uh, feel free to say hello to each other. Introduce yourself in the chat over on the side. So I'd like to uh, introduce our first project that we're going to visit today, and that is Brixton Windmill. Um, and that's going to be presented from by Tim Gladstone from Squire and Partners. This was the last working windmill in London, a 200 year old structure. I can't wait to hear more about how they have ensured that they're preserving it for future generations while providing new flexible space for the wider community. So hi, Tim. Um, very good morning. Um, let me just try, try and uh, share my screen with everyone. Perfect. Take you, to... uh, you need to share it again. It's coming now, I think. <laughs> no, I seem to have so, developed a new problem. Oh, well, try again, because <laughs> uh, it was looking, it was sharing, but then it just needed to go full screen with your presentation. Okay, I'll just try again, everyone. Bear with me. Can everybody see that now? Perfect. Perfect. Well, apologies for that little glitch. Um, well, yes, it's a, it's a great pleasure to tell everyone a little story about the latest tale of Bricks and Windmill, its park and its land, um, and sort of really the adaptive reuse of this um, uh, amazing building, but the, in particular the site and its surroundings. Um, Bricks and I'm sure many of you know it, but it's it's been an amazing place um, from its very origins, where this windmill was built in 18. Uh, 1816 um, and has stood here for 200 uh, plus years and um, has had uh, the full uh, joy of uh, Brixton uh, growing around it. Um, it received lottery funding to be restored because it became a listed building at risk, but it sat, um, as it had done for many years, just alone in the park. Um, but the community have loved the building, and as such, there was the Friends of Brixton Windmill have become the greatest kind of ambassadors for the windmill, but um, it, it needed something else to bring it alive. Uh, the the burden of the windmill, I suppose, as a listed building, it's Lambeth owned, um, and it um, the lottery fund got the building up and running for a while, and in, in gave the bill uh, the building a, a miller, um, and it actually still had a working. Um, grindstone that luckily they put in a hundred years ago um, so they were able to produce flour um, the teamwork in order to make this project happen required Eli Kishimoto a sort of international but also local designers who are cultural ambassadors for the windmill putting their flash pattern on the sails um, there's a local group of schools 10 schools that use the, the windmill as a sort of a learning center and learn sort of almost where food comes from and uh, sustainable power um, but us joining the team uh, we did this completely as a um, pro bono project to get it going and then we were uh, appointed by Lambeth for the, the latter stages the key thing was really trying to work out what what was missing it, you had the park there was there was a little children's playground um, and the, 
the windmill itself was almost trying to be too much. Um, we had to create a sort of self-sustainable brief so uh, to enable growing. The milling was happening. There was desperate need for the storage. If they were milling, there was nowhere to store what they were creating. Then we could create bake and on the back of that the baking could re- work with local businesses but also there could be a shop a shop on site um, a toilet that could complement the um, the center itself the teaching build on the network almost work ourselves into national curriculum um, teaching children but go beyond that and and um, teach a wider audience use the center to create baking classes build on the the beer and bread festival that's been happening for 10 years use weddings the cafe community events parties and partnerships and brixton brewery who we're friendly with um or we all help um the center so it, historically the top left is how it used to look you can see um there used to be a little cluster of buildings around the windmill and windmills need um the miller's cottage and they need the storeroom and they they can't just survive on their own and function on their own um in 1934 and 19 uh, you could see it has become an observation deck people went and had a look um to go up and have a look and the, the sales are gone um and then on the right hand side here you can see the skyline of london and there's the windmill in the bottom left um sitting in windmill gardens um this is a, a site of uh, metropolitan open land again making it very difficult to put any new buildings in there but what we were able to do is uh, on the bottom right you can see um the history of the cluster of buildings that were once there um as long as this, as long as the thames water wall that's currently there going into the car park we use that to really make an argument that um we had to fix the place um to make it work this is the only way that this center um, had to be funded by Lambeth in order to get everything to work and self-sustain going forward. Otherwise, it was just going in one direction, which the building had been down several times before. So this is the center just after it was complete about this time last year. Not not easy in, in COVID, but um, actually lots of positives came out of that. As it sits in the park, the building has to be incredibly robust um, and um, sort of vandal proof if you like and needs to completely shut up at night and be low maintenance so we chose to use materials that are as timeless as the material itself um, and uh, use a uh, douglas fir um, timber frame which um, you can see the images at the top which we helped use to kind of create a campaign and a vision for the building proving it's really super flexible use is what we wanted um the units on the left um they they, they house a, a variety of um, content depending on who's using the building but they all pack away and go away nicely that the unit on the far left actually opens up to become a little museum and shop uh, we really helped um, build the campaign with them that's what was needed um one to get lambeth to f- put the money forward um we used obviously all the social media and the, the windmills now got an amazing amount of followers and actually through through covid um lots of volunteers used the space a lot more and we we managed to tap into some fantastic talent the calendar of events is really now quite magnificent they're, they're going to be announced announcing this um uh, on monday but um working again with us assisting the local team um working with local graphic skills people to generate a, a sort of a brilliant outreach of events so here's all the, the the visions of what we wanted to happen in order to make the project become real um and this is it already but um in the last year um everything that was promised and more uh, that we hadn't quite anticipated the yoga classes that have taken part or hadn't put in the the bat watching into the brief but having a a, a practical building that completely supports the park it supports the windmill it supports the whole message um uh with the local businesses so we we team up and flour is supplied to the bad boys bakery in um in Brixton prison as well as the old post office bakery which is uh, is one of the sort of oldest organic bakeries in london and people like Brixton brewery and um uh, we hope it's going to be uh continues to be an even greater success than it has already been and uh, that's the the end of my little story. 
Thanks so much for sharing that, Tim. And it's amazing to think of um, that that great uh, tradition of history. And actually, you know, it is creative reuse, but this windmill is being used much in the way that it always was, but as a, a broadening understanding of, of where food comes from and how it gets to be to our table. Um, Blossom, can I bring you in uh, first to, to talk to Tim? Um, uh, Tim, thank, thank you so much for uh, such a really interesting uh, presentation goodness there, there's an awful lot going on in in actually <laughs> quite a small space isn't there um, yeah. yeah I, I was uh, I don't know if this is a question but it, I was really struck by what you said about building on what's already there and also what you were just saying at the end about how uh, now that those interventions have happened how that is feeding into the hyper local community and I guess um, that really speaks to me in a, in a really very, how do you concentrate something in a very small area but see quite deep rootedness? And I wonder if you could maybe expand on that a little in terms of what uh, what that's really unlocked in in a community sense, in a local economic sense, um, how it's contributing to the place. Yeah, but it's obviously still it's still happening right now. Mm. But it's but. Um, Often when you're trying to design something flexible, you end up designing all the soul, all the character out of, out of what you're doing. Um, what, this, what this building does, it, there's a few basic needs um, for humans, really. And it's, <laughs> it, it's, um, it's a really joyous um, building that's made of natural materials that talk to you. We completely open we have the ability to fully open up and use the deck. So it's really flexible for multiple users inside, outside, as well as being perfectly good inside. We've got two really nice toilets and an excellent kitchen. And with, with a great space inside out uh, and, and a, a kitchen and some toilets, you can do a lot of different things. Then it's about clever storage. So um, it's uh, the everyone loves a windmill and everyone loves to park. Um, the problem with having a park without a toilet, that anyone with young children know there's a, there's a limited amount of pleasure before some pain is coming um, and nappy changing and everything. That's all built into this center too. So it's, it's from the daily park user, they, their lives are made a hell of a lot better. There's a cafe that's now open, um, run by the volunteers providing coffee. So all you've got, and, and the volunteers will just invite people in and tell them about all the opportunities of the building. So it can grow very much naturally from the people that are already using it. The, the friends of the Bricks and Women will also train, um, they train youngsters um, who otherwise might not have many qualifications into becoming guides, teach them about the windmill, they become millers, and they become qualified um, tour guides, which is a great thing on any one CV. Doesn't matter how many A-level stars you've got, I'd probably spot that note at the bottom of a CV. Um, and, and, and those kind of benefits for the community. But then, People like the chefs that were furloughed, um, they came in and, uh, and actually ha wanted, they helped, helped us set up the kitchen and we provided hot meals for um, children um, who otherwise wouldn't be getting their school dinners. Um, that, that in itself then, we then got baking classes. So the, there's, a, there's a framework for l quite a, a massive amount of possibility. Mm. I don't, I don't answer. I think I answered all your points in that. You did. You did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Justin, can I bring you in? Hi. Morning, Tim. Hi, oh, um, Justin. How are you? Thank you very much for that. Um, I, had, I had a little wander around last week, and um, I think what, what was very interesting is, uh, firstly, how you need a new building to help an old building back to becoming useful yep. again. And actually, it's not really a new building. It's a building that's replacing what would have been there before. So as you were describing it, you know, exactly. um, the windmill has always needed stuff around it um, to make it work. I think the thing that struck me, um, with my architect's hat on, was the, the quality um, of that building is impeccable. And for a piece of public um, construction, it is is way beyond anything that I've, I've ever seen. And I think, you know, your, your point about the toilets is, is exactly that. I've been in worse buildings in the last week, um, <laughs> office buildings with toilets, much, much worse than that. And I think that quality is really important in that hyper-local environment. If you're bringing kids mm -hmm. in who you know, don't have food to eat at the week and so forth, um, it gives them pride in their place. Um, so I, th I think that's really fascinating. And then the furniture and the adaptability of the furniture um, into a shop, uh, into ways you can break that down. And then 
the external screening, which is, you know, there's, there's some tricky antisocial behaviour in that area, um, felt really appropriate um, and quite industrial and almost like a kind of mm-hmm. farm, if you like, whereas it could have felt like a prison really, really quickly. So I think it should be you know, held as a kind of exemplar there. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the funding and um, the fundraising that had to go into that and how you managed to persuade or the team managed to persuade people to invest in, in such quality. Yeah, um, I think you met Jean, didn't you, when you went up to the windmill? And um, she she's an ex-headmistress and an absolute campaigner. And she's the first person I met. Um, I was introduced to unlocking the problem with. And she had been helping the building. The building, after its lottery funding, was basically or instantly sort of decaying again, needs looking after. There's no money being put aside to do it. In fact, the tar the tar on the windmill is suffocating it. It's been painted in tar, so it can't breathe. So this is something else we've got to take on. Um, Lambeth recognised um, uh, Jean's campaign and a lot, uh, some, some excellent local councillors involved, quite appropriately, Councillor Gardner. What a perfect name for someone who's going to help us. <laughs> um, but so... There are a lot of people who, who bid to do these projects. Um, the Windmill Gardens and the Blenheim Estate were recognised at needing support. Um, money got put aside by Lambeth over 10 years ago, um, but it would not be released until um, there's a, a, a viable business plan proven and there was uh, planning obtained. And that's really where that, that we... we that sort of social network, so whether it's the Brixton Design Trail, Ali Kishimoto, but also um, using the power of uh, the social media and the friends of Brixton when we already have, you know, and the wider audience to kind of create a campaign, if you like. Um, and that campaign uh, got made the, made the project uh, a certainty for Lambeth to happen. It's like, okay, we ring fence that money. I think it was something like four hundred thousand um, pounds over ten years ago, and they recognised that we could take that money, and they accepted we could amplify that up to current kind of exchange rate on that. Um, you, although it, it is impeccably detailed, uh, the, the the timber frame is not actually. The, lots of materials we use are not that expensive. They are pretty easy to put together um if, in their simple terms the the you know, a tiled roof gable and brick walls yeah. which are actually just cheaper bricks that we've sooted just you just sit it a breathable sitting process but the timber frame um just ha- was absolutely the right answer um we did go douglas fir instead of oak but it's it's you know more more renewable in this country so there was a there was a small uplift but the the very low maintenance of the building was immediately obvious. Um, so mostly it was the Lambeth completely funded it. As you say, it's hard to get a council to do a new building, but without it, they were the bills they wouldn't be having to spend fixing the windmill every year. Versus this, when this happens, this will pay f- to fix the windmill. It doesn't only run itself; it runs a windmill as well. So it's it's making the windmill work again. And, and I, want to, I, I want to, to bring in Elizabeth before uh, we run uh, out of time. So um, Elizabeth, <laughs> please join me. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the windmill is a 12 minute walk from my flat, which is <laughs> um, absolutely ideal. So I'm going to get involved in more of the events over summer. Um, oh, thank you. It's also, I didn't even know that it existed before I, oh, yeah. I was led there. Uh, it's London, London's best kept secret, lots of people say. But uh, a- Absolutely. <laughs> and, and do you have plans to sort of amplify the, the marketing and the awareness of it? Um, if, I know that with lots of volunteer runs, run yeah. things, often marketing and big campaigns fall to the bottom of the of priority list and things. But what are your yeah. plans going forward? <laughs> No, the plan. I mean, the plans are again use it, using that social media platform. This has been fantastic. The yeah. we we've gained some really quite helpful, influential friends during COVID. Who were people who we've all spent more time in parks, obviously, mm-hmm. but you know these great chefs, um, other leading people from the property industry, um, 
is yeah, one of the directors from Grosvenor is involved and we're now using this as a bit of a case study of how we can make other such projects happen. Um, the, the events the events that are happening are um, pretty well publicized through uh, th their social media. But um, yeah, we, we support it obviously as Squire Partners, Bricks and Bid. Um, I sit on the Bricks and Bid and um, that we're involved in pushing that, uh, pushing the windmill as well. So no, any, anything we can do, but certainly using the um, the savvy awareness of of the kind of all the friends of the windmill. So more friends are better. So you have to become a friend as well. Now. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> I will do. I did go down and I sampled some of the chocolate cake and coffee. Oh, great. And, um, and yeah, just to thank you for the presentation, I feel like it ticked my list of things. So I don't have any further questions. I'm um, no, that's well, that's good because we're out of time. So thank you very <laughs> thank much, you. Uh, Tim, um, and for sharing that uh, project with us. And we're now going to take a trip to Roof East in Stratford with John Burton from Urban Space Management. And this was a multi-story car park um, that's now a cultural hotspot. So John, please join me. Hey, hey, Christine, can you hear Hello. me? All right. I can hear you and see you great. Great, okay. Um, I'm just going to share this document. Oh, Sorry, it's just loading. It's okay, we're here with you. Okay. Perfect, cool. looks great. Is that big enough? Oh, it for looks everyone, great, looks perfect. That's great. Okay. Fantastic. You're getting emoji thumbs up. So off you go. <laughs> Sweet. Okay. I, uh, I'm John Burton. and I work for a company called Urban Space Management. I was involved in the planning and the licensing and the winning of the bid for this project. Unfortunately, I'm not involved in the running of it. I sit by the team who do run it. And uh, the woman who was supposed to be here today uh, has had a, a clash of diaries. Unfortunately, something really important has come up. So I'm deputizing for her. Um, so uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, oh, here we go, sorry. Got to get my priorities right. Okay, the, um, the space is managed by Urban Space Management. Um, we, the, the current use is a bar, games area. We have events, outdoor cinema, with community engagement program as well, and crucially hot food. Um, it's a partnership with London Borough of Newham and um, the launch date was July 2014. In fact, the history of this goes back. It's, it's, it's the multi, top of the multi-story car park in, in the, town, the old town centre, shopping centre. Um, and uh, when Westfield was built, the, the shopping centre didn't die at all, but many people stopped parking there. So they had a, a big problem. Um, and uh, they launched a, a competition in 2013. Uh, it's about 30,000 square feet on one level with 10,000 square feet on another level, and it's fully accessible. There is a, a lift which has been refurbished by the council, two lifts, in fact. It's a very seasonal, this is an outdoor space, so it's very seasonal, and um, the season really is April through to the end of September. We do a month at Christmas as well. Um, you can see there, the top, top photo is the before, um, the... Uh, site was we, we actually were part of a, a town center strategy for uh, Stratford in 2010 and and picked this particular site as a potential project for a short-term meanwhile project um and the council sort of put a bid together we put a bid to, to them rather for a competition in 2013 and we opened in 2014 and you can see the after is is quite a different order of of scale the other key thing to notice on the bottom photo is that very tall residential block and then in the background you've also got uh, Manhattan Lofts block with the, the slice out of it uh, and all around us now there's an increasing sort of amount of um, of uh, residential which has had a particular impact obviously on the design um, and how we use the space. In terms of space design uh, we've tried to be non-inclusive, in, in, intrusive, we, we, we're not allowed to put structures through the Cement, there's a massive floor loading issue to do with how much weight you can put in particular areas. So there's a whole engineering thing. We've been very light touch, 
Uh, we have used these touches like the uh, car cars filled with as planters, which has is, is gone very well. And um, we've also faced the Cinema West. Uh, people can then have a really nice view of, of setting sun o over London. And um, on the residential side, we've had to take a really uh, sensitive approach, both because we were told to by licensing, but also because um, working in, in a kind of mixed area, you've got to be very cognizant that residents don't want to hear a load of noise. So we're not allowed to have anything other than background music, um, which has been a particular challenge, but actually it's a very interesting one. Um, we've reused quite a lot of, of, of stuff for the venue furniture. It was made from, um, there was a, a bridge over the River Lee dismantled as part of the Olympics, post-Olympics. We used a lot of that decking for a whole load of stuff across the site. The original greenery and trees came from Chelsea Flower Show. We worked with the Groundwork Trust on designing the gardens and actually building them. And the bar structure was made from a recycled shipping container and um, the toilets as well, very important. I see Tim was, was going on about the windmill, the toilets and the windmill, absolutely vital, particularly around a bar area, an entertainment area. Uh, they came from another Olympic venue. So we managed to recycle quite a lot of stuff very successfully. Oh, sorry, stay on page. Sorry, I've pressed the wrong button. Here we go. Um, the uh, other side of this is that um, the site is open to all. Uh, when we took over, there were two lifts which were not working from the ground floor up. And there was a, a great councillor at Newham who, who pushed to have them working because he saw it as a, a vital, vital thing. So the council actually put their hands in their, their pockets and actually paid for that refurbishment, which they'd been arguing about for years before and never done anything about it. Um, but the, the idea of the new activity actually focused them on, on this actually happening. And, and that's been a really important point in accessibility to the roof, which is normally not so easily accessible. Um, we've had uh, employment opportunities through Newham Workplace. There is a family offer with free summer activity exclusively for Newham residents. And we've had collaborations with all sorts of local organizations, including Active Newham and Park Lives Newham and the, the local business improvement district, Stratford Original, Theatre Royal, Stratford East, the Creative Quarter as well, and East Village. Um, The most of the family activity and all that kind of stuff is free, um, but we also do low cost activities uh, for all ages. So it's not just a bar for the evening. We do have daytime stuff going on as well. And um, like with anyone, diarising space is always a critical issue. And um, when you've got a space mostly used for the games and the cinema and all that kind of stuff, oh dear me, what's going on? Something's happened. Sorry about Maybe this. Maybe just try and share again. Okay, I'll, I'm going to try and do that. Yeah. Okay. So diarising is a a real issue on on the site, and is something happening? It is. We're sharing, but you just have to advance your slides. Okay. Sorry, I can't, on my screen, I can't see anything at all. That's okay, we see your so, all right. presentation. Okay, so can someone else advance them? Um, mm. Is that mm. possible? All right, well, I, I sorry, I'll carry on, I'll carry on talking. Um, so we have, uh, so we have a, a bunch of activities that can take place, which don't um, clash with the activities uh, that, that are standardly taking place. And this is a kind of issue across all sorts of venues where you, you don't have all the space you need for everything. Um, and we've had a whole bunch of things take place, including uh, the East Wall warm, warm Up, which is a East London dance and Hofesh Ho, Schechter company commissioned and presented uh, by historic Royal Palaces. We've had the comedy festival last year, last year with a whole bunch of good people uh, doing interesting things. Um, life during lockdown has been particularly interesting. Um, let me just see if someone else can help me here with technicals. Hold on a second. Sarah. Uh, no, I, no, don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah, I, I don't know what, um, I don't know how to deal with this sharing screen thing. Um, it's okay. Um, okay. It, it, that's, that's just about your time now. So actually we can go to okay. questions. So if I'll, just, I'll just wait one more point, which is okay. the success of this scheme 
is so strong that it's been included in the future plans for the site by whoever the owners are at the moment and whether we're running it or not it's it's cemented into the future brilliant thanks so much for that john and i'm sorry about the technical difficulties uh, don't worry <laughs> um exactly. blossom i'm gonna bring you in first if you're happy to 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 come in as our east london expert also uh, <laughs> thanks Kristen. um john really good to see you and hey, um hi uh goodness i have had many many evenings at roof east and uh, <laughs> it's a joyous joyous place um Good. and it was great I, I visited a couple of weeks ago just to uh just to kind of uh, have a look around and uh familiarize myself and it was lovely to see it bursting with life uh again after uh after so long where it must have been a really challenging time um yeah. thanks for explaining the yeah. cinema move as well because okay. it used to be You've located oh have i cut out I'll keep trying. Um, am I back? Carry on. Yeah, that's okay. Fine. Um, good. The uh, uh, the cinema <clears throat> cinema's been moved, hasn't it, to uh, yeah. to a different location, which is uh, it's good to see. And that that sunset must be very beautiful. Um, I really wanted to ask about change over time because obviously this wasn't expected to be in place for as long as it as it has been. And of course, Stratford is undergoing vast change at the moment so I, I wondered if if you could reflect on the changing nature of the space in relation to its wider surroundings and how it is has developed over time sure I think the the key thing is that um, just the, the amount of residential development around us is just astonishing it's it really mm. every time I go there is there's another floor added to another building and and, and it's growing all, all the time so that the change, in a sense, was has been imposed on us by the uh, the fact of having to be cognizant of residents, and and that's been a something we've always understood. But it gets there's more pressure every year, and therefore, sort of noise levels wise, we're having to be more careful every year. It's boring technical stuff, but actually really really important um, from that perspective. As you say, we we sort of tweak the design so the cinema did move to the lower level which is a sort of more secure sort of more separately separate off separated off and um, it gives us bigger space to, to work with upstairs it's quite a small space compared with other roof spaces it's it's not enormous up there um i think the other thing in in terms of change is that we we try and keep the hot food offer not varied every year so we we, we try and work with the similar traders but sometimes we we want to make a variation we don't have too many hot food traders either mm. a lot of people overcook it uh, they have too many and then those individual traders don't do as well as they should do in terms of their individual business the bar has developed over time as well it's sort of improved and um then the games we try and try and introduce a fresh game every year when i say we it kind of there's a we're, we're, we're an umbrella. Urban space management, the people have the lease and the relationship, we pay the rent to the council. So we're guaranteeing that relationship. Mm -hmm. We then have a bunch of sub-tenants who are the people who are actually on the ground doing the, so the people who run the cinema, the people who run the bar, all the hot food traders and the games people, they're all individual businesses. Um, so we're promoting them. Uh, we, we do a lot of the marketing and, and that, that kind of thing. So it's, it's a kind of a landlord-tenant relationship but a partnership as well. Hopefully that's answered some of your question. That's super. Thanks, John. Thanks for your question, Blossom. Elizabeth, can I bring you in as an asset manager, maybe to uh, ask John a little bit more about his approach? Absolutely, yes. I just wondered, John, if you could um, speak us through, speak me through maybe one um, innovation that you're particularly proud of. I think, I think, funnily enough, I think it's the it's the overall approach um uh, urban space management company i work for we started camden lock in 1974 we ran it for 20 something years we don't run it anymore and um we started spitalfields we ran that in the 90s and um we i'm speaking from a place called trinity boy wharf at the moment all of them have in common that our approach which is basically hard work and um listening to what the area needs i'm not bringing in massive investments uh on the hope that something will happen we're a very organic developer so um i think the overall approach is is that and where we perhaps differ from other rooftop areas is that we have a real mix of stuff so you you have your your bar your hot food 
but we also have the games and we also have the cinema and then we also have a sort of more community involvement side as well on, on the quieter sort of times out of the evenings. So I think it's the overall kind of package we're presenting. And um, I think one of the things we're quite proud of, actually, is the relationship that we do have with the council and the fact that we've helped change to a quite a degree the way that Stratford is seen. Certainly pre-Olympics and post-Olympics, it was a very tricky time for Stratford. And, and whilst there are loads of housing developers doing schemes there, and that's helping, obviously, uh, the fuel the local economy and, and bring young, younger, newer people to the borough, we're actually providing a lot of those people with a kind of a really interesting outlet, uh, which also attracts London-wide people. But I think it's, it's changed the offer in Stratford in a way that Westfield can't do and doesn't do and wouldn't hope to do. Um, and we're very proud of that, particularly, I think. Fantastic, thank you. Justin, I'm gonna bring uh, you in now, um, if you have some thank questions. You. Thanks for that, John, that was really, um, really interesting. Um, and appreciating your technical constraints of you know not being able to fix down to the concrete and things whilst being at the very top of the building, probably in a fairly windy site. Correct. Um, I was I was fascinated with the reuse and kind of upcycling, um, particularly from the Olympic venue um, that you mentioned and the Chelsea Flower Show and the toilets and things. And that sounds sounds like a real throwaway comment, but having done something much much smaller scale, it's it's very difficult. Um, very time consuming. It takes a lot of man hours actually to do that. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. I think crucial to that was our relationship with um, Groundwork Trust and what we did for the bid. And, and, and the bid was mostly um, uh, individual hot food operator might have approached the council with for the bid to, to win the bid. We we went as an umbrella and we went in partnership with Groundwork Trust. And um, they, they're they really good. At that point, they were very linked into the Olympic kind of activity. And the whole they, they were offered a whole bunch of things by the Olympic Development Delivery Agency um, in terms of spare uh, materials and, and uh, seating and all sorts of things that were being taken out of the Olympic Park post-Olympics because there was a sort of master plan for post-Olympics and a huge amount of stuff had to be got rid of, including this, this very wide bridge that took people across the Lee was reduced dramatically. It's still an enormous bridge if you go there today, but it was it was reduced. So all that amazingly wonderful oak decking was was able to be used. So ground, groundwork projects, which were beneficial to the communities, were actually given the a kind of all clear for and the first priority for a call on that. So um, the in terms of the toilets, they came from a, another scheme that had um, tragically gone bust at Silvertown and um, was was sitting in, in the, the, the toilets were there in a, in a 40 foot container. Um, the receiver was quite happy for us to take them on through London Borough of Newham. And um, the Chelsea Flower Show thing again was another groundwork link. So we were very lucky actually in that groundwork had, had built up that network of links to make that possible because you're absolutely right. The, the amount of time and energy you have to put in to just to, 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 for reusing materials is really, really tough. And um, it's an underlying sort of problem, obviously, the reality of, of making that work in relation to everything that we all want to do, which is, you know, reuse as much material, particularly building material. Um, so we were, I think, I think I would say we, we kind of lucked out with our relationship with Groundwork. But also our attitude is very much light touch and low investment. So if we can get something cheap and free, we, we can organize a, a crane. We had a craning day when we craned everything up onto the car park. We had to reserve a special area in the, in, on the ground because you, you can't drive things up. There's a low limit on height and stuff. So the technical side was actually quite, it was fun and interesting, uh, although not, not, you know, not, not building a new building type fun and interesting. Well, I guess that's the benefit of having, you know, a number of sites and doing that over the years. You actually build up yeah. that network to enable that Absolutely. to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Yeah, they're right. Thank you. It's a really amazing reminder that actually reusing stuff is hard work, which yes. I, I think probably people don't necessarily think about, but just the logistics of 
of, of sending it out, storing it somewhere and getting it in there. But um, yeah. I, I'm, I've got one minute, so I'm going to, to, to take the chair's priority and just uh, ask you a question about that relationship with the residents. You talked about having to keep the noise level down. Yeah. How is that? How is that relationship? Um, you know, given is it is it uh, tense or is it growing in appreciation or and how how do you navigate that? Yeah, I think um, that there's obviously good and bad. Um, in the good side, we are providing something that a lot of the people who are buying those flats want to enjoy. So they're, they're both uh, the kind of millennial type people who actually are quite tolerant of of the kind of things we're doing. On the negative side, you always get people, someone complaining. You can't avoid that. And but equally, our license, uh, our alcohol and entertainment license is very, very prescriptive about this. And to be fair to the council, they always saw it as a potential problem. And quite rightly so. I know quite a lot of, uh, you know, we were approached all the time by people who want to do big music events up there, which we just, we can't handle at all. And um, we're quite open and honest with people about the fact that we'll have background noise. And if someone is overstepping the mark, we'll, we'll make sure that the noise is turned down. So it's... It's more important for us to maintain our future there than to have some event which is noisy and pisses everybody off and, and, and then, you know, our license is under threat. There's no point in going there at all. So the, we, we welcome the new residents because they're our customers, not all of them, but many of them are. Many of them appreciate what we're doing. And also we're quite kind of sanguine about the fact that we all live in places where we've got to tolerate each other. So... Um, we also we also want to benefit from keeping our license long term. So we're we're good people. Uh, I, I like to think on the whole, the the number of uh, of um, people who've who've complained is is gone down over the years. I must say though, that's one good factor. Okay, well, I just that just leaves me to thank you for sharing that project with us, and thank thanks to the judges for your um, excellent questions. No um, it, it, we're now going to move to our. Final project in this, yes, emoji applause, please. We're now going to move to our final project in this category. Welcome, Martin Evans from you and I. You're here to present the record store at the old final factory. Yeah, hello, Christine. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks very much. Very nice of you to spend the time to listen to me today and the others. And hello, Johnny. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, uh, the window, and share. Can you see it? Um, yes, but you just need to make it a slight, that's perfect, we're ready to go. How is that? I All right. So this picture was, I'm going to whip through this, I've got 10 minutes, right? That is right. Okay, I'm going to go fast. So this picture was painted in 1906. Uh, it shows, uh, sorry, 1911. It shows a factory just west of London in a little town called Hayes, that five years before this picture was painted was a farm. Uh, no more. H Hayes and Harlington, the train station that is that, that train probably just pulled out of, is uh, now uh, the nearest train station to Heathrow and is uh, a crossrail station that will open whenever crossrail opens. In 1931, so 20 years later, 30, uh, 20 years later, it looked like that. Uh, and it was a, a time of incredible industrial growth in our country. Uh, the, 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 the company that came here in, 19, in 1906, five years before this picture, was called the Typewriter and Gramophone Company. And by 1931, when this picture was photograph was taken, it had changed its name to the Electronic Music Industries Limited and it became EMI. And uh, EMI's largest consumer brand at that point was uh, the brand under which they pressed all their records, which was his master's voice, which was born here in Hayes. Uh, this uh, business grew and grew and grew, and through the 1950s and 60s became one of the largest companies in the UK, and the site around the town of Hayes grew and grew and became uh, 150 acres of factory, and in the mid-60s, 25,000 people worked there. It was huge. So the town of Hayes grew up around this factory. It was a single industry town. All of the people who didn't work at EMI worked in businesses and in services that serviced the business and the factory, and it was a it was a one business town. So you can imagine, and here's what happened. This picture was taken in 1930, and they show what very highly skilled workers making beautiful pieces of furniture in which had the latest technology, which were wind up gramophones. Uh, every Beatles record that was ever pressed in the UK was pressed there at Hayes and was sent all around the world. 
In 2011, my company bought the site uh, that you see there in uh, at red lined. Hayes and Harlington train station is just to the right where the bridge is across the train line uh, of our site. And our site there is just under 20 acres of what was originally the 150 acres of that site. That business had wound itself down and by the early 1980s, it had left completely. They'd moved their manufacturing overseas as had most of London's industry and uh, it was locked up and derelict. And it remained derelict for nearly 30 years. And you can see from this picture exactly how it works in these small uh, outer London towns. To the right and, and above, to the north, you can see the residential part of the town. And then just around our red line site there, you can see, as is very common in this kind of uh, local towns, the light industrial area. So uh, post EMI leaving, this just became a, a wasteland. And you can imagine how many people lost their jobs in that town as that factory wound itself down and the typical problems we see in many parts of outer London when industry leaves, the problems that that leaves in a place like this town, which was thriving and uh, now in trouble. That leaves with the planners and the local authority with a problem. How do you keep the uh, light industrial area in a town like that essential for the provision of jobs for the people who live in that town? when there is no appetite for anybody to come and put their business in a place like that. It's a huge conundrum that just simply leaves a place like this empty for the decades that it's empty. So we took our site on um, in 2011 with a mission to change the planning policy. So that's what we knew that we had to do. We had to try to persuade the planners that in order for them to make this site work, it had to be a mixed use site. It had to be a part of the town center because in macro geography, this place is amazing. It's two miles from Heathrow. It's right next to the main train line going west up Paddington. It's tucked into the corner of the M4 and the M25, fantastically well located. Just to the west of it, there is a whole slew of uh, business parks where large international companies have their headquarters. So there is no reason to imagine, if you sat behind a desk in central London with a spreadsheet in front of you, why this site might not work. When you get on the train and walk down the road and look at this site, however, the microgeography is terrible. It's grim uh, in that part of that town. And so it's just simply unattractive. So we knew that what we had to do was make it attractive. And if we were ever going to attract a single job back to this site, and that's where we get to uh, the point of what we're here to talk about today, which is creative reuse of a site. Because in order to turn a previously dead light industrial site on the edge of a town on the edge of London like this into a thriving place where people are going to work, you have to be creative. And so what we managed to do was persuade the planners that the 4,000 jobs they thought ought to be on that site, because that's how many jobs there were on that space of land when it was densely populated as a place of industry. We had to persuade them that we could get 4,000 jobs on half of it so that we could develop the other half out to resi and deliver a uh, viable scheme. The buildings that you can see on the site there were the original uh, looked like that when we took the site on, uh, industrial dereliction at its finest. But they're fine buildings. These were built in the late 1920s by uh, an architect called Wallace Gilbert and Partners, who built the Firestone Factory and the Hoover Building uh, in Paravale. Beautiful buildings. Uh, there was enough floor space in the existing buildings to put 4,000 people in office accommodation. So we just needed to work out how on earth you could persuade companies to come to a place like this in the middle of effectively nowhere uh, and locate their businesses. And so we began the process of turning this into a creative, attractive place. First off, use its heritage. So we changed its name from London Gate Business Park, that it had been named by its previous owners, uh, into uh, the old vinyl factory, because that's what it was. There was one company based in one of the buildings on site, miserable and unhappy and left alone for many years. So we gave them a really lovely cafe and restaurant in the ground floor of their building, covered the walls in seven inch singles. We put an exhibition up of photographs from EMI of the history of the site, um, just hung great big pictures from the ceiling in an empty space. 5,000 school children came through this site in the first 18 months we were there, learning about the history of their town. This was the previous owner's marketing suite. 
in a really unattractive far end of the site, about as far as away as you could get from the train station. Um, some pots of paint turned it into this, and we opened it as a community space for anybody in the local community to come and use. Uh, and this is us with Radio One doing a series of broadcast events from the site. We encourage young people to come with their musical instruments and play music in the buildings where the music had been made. And we recorded them, made films, ran a website called the Old Vinyl Factory Sessions, simply to just try to create some life in the place. We engage with the local community. This is some pictures taken at an event where, when we arrived in the town, we'd heard that it was dead. Uh, we sent an invitation out around the town and promoted a uh, open day at the site. A thousand people came who either had used to work in the site themselves or whose family members worked in the site, bringing all manner of memorabilia and stuff uh, relating to their family's history on the site. It was the most incredible and amazing day where you, of course, learn that no place dies. Uh, it's just not been given the opportunity to shine. Um, this uh, is a CGI of the scheme that we got planning for in 2014 and that we are now 80% delivered. Uh, it is um, completely uh, planned, it's, it's uh, underway, it'll finish in a couple of years' time. I say we've got about 700,000 square feet of commercial space, we've got 650 homes, and then at the ground floor around all of those homes and office buildings, uh, a whole range of uh, ground activation of cafes, restaurants, food and bev uh, players. We've got a climbing wall, and just about to start on site is a cinema uh, and entertainment venue. So through a creative imagining of how you turn a previously light industrial site into a new part of the town center, whilst retaining the opportunity to put jobs in there, which is what drives planning policy in the first place for it to be workplace driven, has to be a creative enterprise because you have to make that place attractive. Uh, and so this is what will be at ground floor in the long term, a climbing wall, cafes, uh, uh, entertainment venues, food stores, collaborative spaces, um, and here are just some pictures of what it's going to look like when the final buildings are finished. So this is the cinema complex um, uh, tacked onto one of the oldest buildings on site that we've restored. So all, all but one of the buildings on the site that we inherited, we've restored um, with our architects and have reimagined re them as places for the future. There's a school on site, an academy school, uh, that's sponsored by Global, the uh, radio and broadcast company. 800 young people are learning. So if, again, from a dead place, one of the earliest interventions on site with 800 young people. And you don't get more creative than that of 800 young people running around and turning a place from being dead and buried into a place that's very, very much alive and extraordinarily noisy. Um, and here again, the cinema. And this is just some of the landscaping that's emerging between the buildings that are in the final phases of development and a six metre high uh, sculpture of Nip of the Dog that was originally the um, HMV logo. And that is where I'm going to leave you. And there is the site. Thanks for that, Martin. I'm um, really glad that uh, we got to do that quick lightning stop tour of the site. Um, may I pass to you, Justin, first this time to put your questions to do me? I, do I have to stop sharing, Christine, or is that You're done? good, you've already stopped shared. You can come back. And... Hello, Justin. Hi, Martin. Thank you very much for that, and thank you for the tour um, last week. Um, I, th I thought a few of the interesting things around the project. One is how I thought it was really brave that you and I took on that project um, following two previous unsuccessful development attempts. Um, and I think I think that's that's real testament to, to the company, and also then how you picked up on the vinyl factory in EMI, which was the heart of the town and that kind of industrial area, and then actually became a negative because they moved out. So suddenly you've got thousands of jobs and people were unemployed, and how you brought that back in um, to the site and made it a positive again. I thought I thought that was really interesting. Could you tell us a little bit about? what you think the value of keeping the existing buildings uh, were, A, in terms of um, attracting investment, benefits to the occupants, and then benefits to the local community? Yeah, for us, it's a good question. It's a really straightforward answer, Justin. 
it, it has many and it has many parts that feel to me so sort of obvious. Places like that that have been there are many many places like that around London and our cities all around. I'm in Manchester today. I'm sitting in the middle of one in Manchester uh, that are written off because they were places of the past. They were industrial centres of the past that had a kind of job that doesn't exist anymore. And uh, it is very easy to just say, well, you know, that's never going to happen. Uh, of course, that's not true. And we knew that very early on with that site by that day that we had where we publicised an open day in the town and the thousand people who came to tell us that they were not dead and buried and gone. All of those people were still living in that town and were super interested in what happened in that in that place, in including not just old, older people who worked there many decades ago, but their families and their children and their grandchildren who were all committed to the place where they live and super interested in a job locally. Um, and so that understanding that what was there needs to be celebrated and used for for the benefit of everybody starts very early when we turn up on a site like that. Next is the obvious sustainability benefit. Uh, it, it, to keep a building and reuse it is the most sustainable thing you can do rather than pull it down and build new. So that's a very straightforward and simple thing to do. But also a sense in which you, if you're creating a place that needs to be a new place that needs to be rooted in the history and heritage of that town and just be a reimagining of it, that's what you need to do. Reimagine that place. There's nothing wrong with those buildings, those big commercial buildings. They were designed to be factories. But of course, what we want now in our office buildings is the same things that they wanted when they built those factory buildings. So they have windows that open in those buildings. And so there is a way of thinking about natural ventilation rather than putting great big, huge uh, aircon systems in. The floor plates are large and, uh, and airy because they were designed to have machinery in them that got very hot. And so that's exactly what we want now, flexible. And also because they were built at a time when um, machinery was, technology was changing so fast, they were designed to be flexible. Well, that's exactly what we want now, flexible floor plates. Uh, they've got very high floor to ceiling uh, heights, super nice for uh, office buildings now. So the, the basic ingredients of those buildings is good. So you have to start with a sense that you might keep them and reimagine them. And also they're these. Yeah, cool, thank you. Larsam, can I ask you to join? and the conversation. Sure, of course, thanks. Um, Martin, thanks for a really interesting presentation sure. and uh, goodness, what, what an extraordinary, extraordinary sight. Um, I'm really struck by your description about taking the heritage and that, not just that, that kind of building heritage, but the people heritage of, of the place. And I wonder if you could talk me through how that expands yes. into into the next next phase. So yes. I'm interested particularly in your workspace mix yes. and type of uh, business strategy. Right, that's also a great question because what's really easy to do in a place like that is to be very creative and interesting with the buildings that you have and decide that you're going to reuse them instead of pulling them down and then think that that's enough. Mm. Um, also then, when we dug around in the archives and we found out the extraordinary history of that site, it's very easy just to hand that over to the marketing people and say, here's a lovely story for you to make your brochure about. Rather than understanding how you take that history and use it to inspire, you look back in order to inspire the future. And so to think one step beyond the fantastic imagery of the pop music that came out of that site and just be able to have a nice cover for a brochure and imagine that it wasn't actually pop music that was the thing there, even though it sort of was. It was innovation, industrial innovation. That's what happened on that site. Stereo was invented there. Vinyl was invented there. The airborne radar was invented there. The television was turned into a consumer product. Cat scanners were invented on that site. And when you start to understand the innovation history of that place that was framed by its buildings and its environment, then you can see how you just pull that thread and you just draw it along to the future. And so one of the first things we did, partly as a marketing exercise to encourage people who thought that it was a filthy, horrible, dead place and they'd never come there in a million years, but partly to pull that thread was that we opened a thing called the Central Research Laboratory, which was an evocation of 
the central research laboratory that had been on site as part of EMI's act of activity, which was full of probably mostly men at that time in white coats as scientists, inventing stuff and created a new version of it for what needs to be invented today. And so we partnered with the GLA and with Brunel University to create a innovation hub, a sort of accelerator. It's still running. It's now spun itself off into an independent business that we're rolling out to other sides around the country. But that, has, but that that activity, opening that space, putting young people into it, inventing and innovating, was what turned our operation around from being a dead, miserable place into an exciting, future-focused place that meant tenants started queuing up in the right way to put their businesses. So Sonos were one of our first occupiers there who came along specifically because of what they saw happening in the ground floor of the building. So it's about using the inspiration of the past to pull a thread and create the relevant inspiration for the future. So it's absolutely relevant to who it is that comes and sits at a table in those offices and starts to innovate and create economic growth and jobs. Super, thank you. I love that description of the thread from the past, bringing you into inspiration for the future. So thanks for sharing that, Martin. Elizabeth, can I invite you to the stage now to put your question? Absolutely. Forward. Thank you, Martin. To hear about a place that's had had to change public perception of it. Um, um, but my question, you have touched on it briefly but it's a question about the environmental impact obviously you've used old buildings which is much better than pulling them down and putting new ones up but have you and i used any new environmental um processes or any sort of eco design products that we might be interested to hear about you're a mute how did that happen there we go uh, thanks uh so the way that our business plan rolls out is that we are master planners and storytellers and opportunity creators. Almost all, apart from the refurb of the existing buildings, almost all of the plots on site have been delivered by other more specialist uh, people, mostly housing developers. Um, the, the first uh, scheme that we put up was the school, um, which was an uh, off-site manufactured modular build that ha happened incredibly sustainable, incredibly fast, and it, 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 I was dumbfounded at how great that building is and how quick and how cost effective and how good it is in, in its performance, in its environmental performance, it, amazing. Um, what's, what's interesting for us as master developers working with other partners to deliver our sites is what role we can play in encouraging a site-wide strategy in terms of sustainable delivery, sustainable build, and sustainable operation. And so we've worked very hard with our lawyers who uh, were very excited to find out how important they might be in that process uh, to encourage our sales contracts and our JV contracts to require a certain level of environmental performance from the buildings that we, that we uh, are not gonna be procured and delivered by us. Um, so it's about what, what's been most interesting for us is about how far we can push that envelope as master developers. It's very easy in that set of relationships to hold your hands up and say, it's nothing to do with me. You know, I've done the master planning, I've done the, I've done, got the planning, I've laid out the site, uh, somebody else is delivering that building, that's up to them. And that's, and that's a cop out for, for me because it, 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 it's always going to be our story that we created the context and the environment in which that site was delivered if, if part of it by others. And so I, I think uh, I can't talk about specific performance in delivery because that is somebody else's responsibility, but I can talk about how it, as master developers and freeholders, we can use our power of sale to influence what those people do and how they procure on site. So that we're able to say when that site is finished, generally across this site, there is an approach to sustainability that is thoughtful and innovative. Absolutely. Thank you. Our lawyers are very happy in that series because they get to be important. <laughs> well, Martin, I, I just need to um, draw this, uh, unfortunately, conversation to a close because we've reached the um, end of uh, our, this category and this session. So thanks very much for sharing the story of 
the old vinyl factory with us. And we are now going to uh, close the session. Thank you for the thumbs up and the hearts, everybody. We're now gonna close the session and our judges are gonna go and deliberate on who will win the golden pineapple for creative reuse. So a uh, hugely exciting moment for us. As for you, uh, please enjoy a little break. We will be back at one o'clock with Mahek Agarwal. She is a urban, a uh, planner and a public policy professional who's worked with the Center on Global Energy Policy and the International Climate Change Commission and Committee um, in order to propose better policies for creating more sustainable places. So don't miss that at one o'clock. And we'll be back this afternoon with the shortlisted projects for sustainable transport, um, all these active travel initiatives, many of them that have come out of the pandemic. So join us then as well. And uh, feel free to join a table in the social lounge and we'll see you back here really soon.